Welcome to this service of worship with the House of Hope Presbyterian Church. We have a variety of online offerings in addition to this worship service for children and families, for youth, and for adults. You can find them on our calendar on the website, hohchurch.org, just below the live stream connection. You can also find the bulletin there. And if you wish to receive an email from the church each week letting you know what is happening, please contact the church office by email, or you can give us a call and leave your email address on the phone. You are welcome here, and we are glad to be your church today. Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord hearkens to our call, listening to our pleas and hearing our prayers. We will praise God, who gives rest to our souls. In the court of the house of the Lord, in the presence of all God's people, we acknowledge our faith. We will call on the Lord as long as we live. We are your servant, O God. You have loosed our bonds. We will offer sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. How shall we repay the Lord for all we have been given? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. The Lord is with you. There is so much that can interfere with our relationship with God. We confess together in an effort to clear our focus and draw near to the Holy One. I invite us to pray together this confession. Gracious God, you are indeed generous. You gave us the gifts of the Spirit, which enabled us to have so much. We forget, however, that we have been recipients of other people's generosity and enjoyed the fruits of their labors. Believing that what we have is ours, we forget that all we have is yours. Forgive us. Forgive us for hoarding your generosity. Forgive us for assuming our labor in this life is meant primarily to benefit us. Inspire us to sow your seeds through the House of Hope's ministries so that all may share in creation's abundance. Turn us into laborers in your harvest that is more abundant than imaginable to make true the promise that no one will know scarcity.
Even though we can become distant from God, we are never separated from God's love. Each day we are invited to live further and deeper into the truth of our forgiveness and the salvation that is ours. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quick, three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cake. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. When he took curd and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood on, by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance before, behind them. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have gone old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a ch child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son of, in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now, Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? The Lord of the Lord, thanks be to God.
Our next scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 35th verse and going into the 10th chapter. Hear then the word of God. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news of the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be wholly acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Theology in universities used to be known as the queen of the sciences. It is no longer known that way in universities generally. Economics, however, is known as something better or worse, I'm not sure. It's often called the dismal science. And so, of course, I am drawn to both of them, the former queen of the sciences and the dismal science. And if you happened to download the bulletin for today, and remember, you can always uh, get the bulletin by going, looking underneath this webcast, and there's a line to click, and you can download the bulletin and, and participate in that way if you'd like. Um, you'll find a quotation there from a St. Paul native, Stephen Levitt, who has taught for many years economics at the University of Chicago. Levitt wrote, Freakonomics, a rogue economist explores the hidden side of everything, and in it he wrote the following. If morality represents how people would like the world to work, then economics shows how it actually works. We might replace the word morality in this quotation with religion or spirituality or ethics or faith. 
Now, coming from an economist, this statement fairly drips with hubris. The subtext being, don't listen to all the spiritual leaders, the ethicists, the philosophers. Listen to me, the economist, who can describe how the world really works. You can find that out from me. I've read a lot of Stephen Levitt's work and listened to him in lectures and on the Freakonomics podcast, and I don't think he's a great deal more full of pride or hubris than any other human I've encountered. I think what Levitt is expressing here is a version of the truth often expressed, which is, if we want to learn what a person truly believes and trusts in, we can't just listen to what they profess. We have to watch what they do. We have to look at a person, how a person acts, how they exercise their agency in the world, how they behave. And in a consumer society, our agency, how we act in the world, is largely lived out through how we use our money. Or, as Billy Graham said, give me five minutes with a person's checkbook, and I will tell you where their heart is. But this isn't only true in a consumer society. The prophets of Israel frequently criticize the people of Israel who participate in worship and religious festivals but fail to follow the words of the Torah to care for the widow, the orphaned, the, the oppressed. Jesus criticizes the powerful of his day for praying on street corners but failing to feed the hungry or care for the least of these. They are in many ways saying something similar to what Stephen Lovett is saying. If morality represents how people would like the world to work, then economics shows us how it actually works. Economics is, he's saying, the key, or at least a key, to understanding human behavior. So money, we see, is tied directly to human agency, to what we can accomplish in the world, how what we can get done as people. And for good or ill, the more money we have, the more agency we have in the world, the more we can get done as people. At this point in human history, it's a vital, perhaps the vital way People exercise their agency, their humanity. I may not be a fan of that. Um, I'm not, but that doesn't mean it's not true. So if money is vital to our agency and how we use it shows, the wor shows how the world actually works, it's pretty important how we get it, this money this liquid agency. For most people, we get money through labor, though for a very important and small, rich group of people, um, they get their money primarily through getting, collecting rent, so charging um, interest on money, sharing profits with uh, other people who own capital with them. Uh, getting money from investments and out of business ventures. But for most people, labor is how we get our money. It's how we use our agency in the world. If we're understanding agency, we trade our labor for money. We use our agency to get this liquid agency. Now, of course, it's more than that. Our expertise, our education, our experiences, our jobs also, at least in our culture, often serve as the most important components of our identities. 
after we learn someone's name, often the next question, if not always the next question, is what do you do? And, you know, they aren't asking me what TV show I like to watch or what my hobbies are. They want to know how do you make your money? How do you earn your money? How do you trade your labor in this world? It's an important part of most people's identities. And at this time when people are losing their work in huge numbers, there's the shock both of losing agency, the ability to act in the world, but also losing identity. When we talk about labor, though, I also want to say we talk, are also talking about the labor market. Markets are simply the idea of where things are traded. I have five oranges, you have five apples, you want oranges, I want apples, we trade. Money is a proxy for that value, so we can trade these things. So the labor market helps us to determine how much liquid agency, how much money we can trade our agency for. Some people are blessed because they would spend their days doing the same thing that they are now doing, whether money was involved or not. What their job is closely aligns with how they would like to use their agency in the world. People are willing to pay them to do what they want to do. I don't know if that's most people or not most people. Maybe it's some of each. Most of us in our work have some things that we love to do and we do without pay and we have things that, you know, we, you couldn't pay us enough to do, but it's part of this job and I like the job, so I'll do it. Some of us really love our, our work, how we exercise our agency, how we get paid for our agency. Some of us in the world, some humans simply work because we need to work. We need to get along in the world. So wherever you fall on the need your job or love your job spectrum, we're behaving as laborers, as humans, within the parameters of the market economy that we have built in our nation and in our world. We're responding to the incentives that have been baked into the rules written and unwritten, of how our world is constructed. In our gospel today, we read, well, we hear Jesus say to his disciples and to us that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Ask, therefore, that the Lord of the, harv the, Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then Jesus immediately sends out the disciples, instructing them, their laborers here, the laborers into the harvest, instructing them to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is near, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse lepers, to cast out demons. And he goes on and says, you received without paying, so give without pay. Take no gold, no silver, no copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, not two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves their food. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus is pointing, if you'll permit me then, to a discrepancy between supply and demand in the labor market. In our economy, in a market economy, at least in theory, if there is a plentiful harvest, if there's something of great value that needs labor, and there's not enough laborers, well, wages then are raised until there are enough workers 
willing to do the work for that wage. At least in theory, that's how it works. And generally, I would say that is how it works. But in a God's economy, the disciples are called to be laborers. But that because they have received without paying, they should give without pay. And they shouldn't even bring any money or food or knapsack with them. Not even a change of clothes. This is not a good labor contract. But in this case, the disciples aren't given an option to negotiate. And Jesus says that this is because they have been given everything by God and they cannot charge for God's free gifts, healing, the good news of the kingdom, that the kingdom is near. Those aren't commodities that they can sell, even though they are of infinite worth. Even more, though, they are called to radically trust the people who they minister among. They have faith in Jesus. But Jesus says, go. And the wages of their work are an even more radical faith, reliance, and trust upon God, but also upon God's people, the people they are ministering with. How will they eat? God will provide. How? The people you are among. And it's a rich harvest. They benefit. They receive the care of people food in people's homes. I imagine they receive water to wash their feet with and hands, prayers for their well-being and care. They get to know whom they're among. They are benefiting, and they are bringing God's good news and healing and benefiting the places where they go and minister. It's a rich harvest. Everyone benefits. It's work that in this world we need badly. But it's work that we generally aren't willing to pay for. It's not monetized. Maybe it's not even monetizable. Maybe it shouldn't be. Paying for friendships or for ministry kind of rubs me the wrong way. But those are the most important things in our lives. Our friendships, our relationships, the healing and justice that comes out of rich friendship and faithful relationship with God and with neighbor. Another truth about this sort of work is that it doesn't scale well. It doesn't lead to increasing productivity. We've had increasing productivity for so long, we kind of take it for granted. What does increased productivity mean? Well, it means that For every hour of human labor that's put in, more is produced. And this works great with economies of of scale and in factory work and making stuff. Indeed, we've come to a place in our society where even those who are poor in some ways have more stuff than they can fit into their homes. We're great in making stuff. It scales well. We can do it super well. But this work doesn't scale. I can't give it to a machine. I can't give it to a factory. I can't outsource its production. 
And there are a lot, there's lots of work in the world like this. And if we want to do it, it's not super productive. Some work doesn't scale. It leads to lower productivity in some ways. It's not actually how the world works, but we've built this world. We've structured its incentives. We've invented money, valued labor. If the fruits of labor in the economy of God are different than the fruits of labor in our current world, how might the economy of God inform and change our economy? How the world actually works. Well, in some ways, it al it's already transformed it. We have many people without work, not because they aren't willing to labor, but because there's not work to be done, or is there? There are things that need to be put right in the world that, is, that are worthy of labor. Perhaps we need to value those things, monetize it even. There's some work that can be done if we lower its productivity. Education, for instance. Can we make education better by making class sizes bigger and having fewer teachers? That's an increase in production. Bigger classes, fewer teachers. More people through the school, oh, factory, I mean. Maybe we need to be less productive. More teachers, more nurses, more doctors, more caregivers. It's not how we've built our economy. But that work, that healing work, that relationship building that is the core of what those disciples are going out to do, that radical trust in others, in God, in humanity, that can inform how we build the economy now, the world now. Do I know exactly how to do it? I'm not an economist. I'm not a professional theologian. I'm a pastor. It sometimes even boggles my mind that the work I do is seen worthy of money. shouldn't be, not in this world, not the way the world works. But even as Stephen Levitt says, the economics shows how the world really works. That world is subject to God's intervention and ours. Not in a Pollyanna-ish way but in the ways that we see when the disciples are sent out to do their work, work that they're not getting paid for, that they're giving away freely. And yet they don't starve. And yet they are taken care of. And they reap a harvest, a harvest that perhaps cannot be monetized. but a powerful harvest nonetheless. A harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. If you're part of the House of Hope Presbyterian Church, you are called to be this kind of laborer. In your work, that may be your identity, and in your life, especially for the relationships in life, ones that you have and ones that you will develop. And the harvest that you reap, it won't go into your bank balance, but it'll benefit you and the whole world. 
and the world needs this labor. This labor of love and of the nearby kingdom of God now more than ever. Amen. Please stand as you wish or are able and join me in affirming our faith using these words from the Confession of Belhar. We believe that God has revealed himself as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God, in a world full of injustice and enmity, is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. That God calls the church to follow him in this, for God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. That God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind. That God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly. That for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and seek the right. That the church must, therefore, stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice, so that, in, so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That the church, as the possession of God, must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and with the wronged, that in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Amen. Please be seated. And I invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer. Lord of love, God of grace, 
We thank you always and still for the many gifts and great beauty that besieges our lives. For all that delights our eyes, for the sun's warmth on our skin, and the way the rain nurtures all life on the planet. For gardens and pets, for family and time to play, we give you thanks. And as we then turn to the concerns on our minds and hearts, we bring you the grief and ambiguity we feel since the coronavirus eclipsed normal life. The virus has sickened many strangers, but also some we know and love. We pray in particular for those facing the illness alone in quarantine or in the hospital. And we pray for families of all who have died or are dying and beg strength for all the medical personnel and caregivers. And we pray for Asian lives, for any that have been harassed or harmed by prejudice fomented around the place from which the virus originated. But then, Lord, George Floyd's death eclipsed the virus. So we widen the circle of our prayer to include his family, to include community organizers and lawmakers as we seek reform and health for our communities. We pray for all those whose businesses and workplaces were burned. And we pray for black lives. We pray we as a country make it all the way through the growing pains of breaking down systemic racism this time. Guide us to a real peace and grant us the strength and wisdom to persevere. Now, Holy One, we must ask you in this moment that you would help us understand this time. We need to give this virus the respect and careful choices it demands and yet still support one another, still reap the joys and do the work of being church and being community. We look to you, creator, redeemer, and sustainer for our very being and calling. We have the natural desire to get back to normal when you perhaps are doing here a new thing. And so we look to you with eyes and minds and hearts. We practice living the example of the Christ. And every moment we breathe in the new life of your spirit. Bless our children and grandchildren. Help us to help them to grow tall and strong and loving. Heal the sick and mend our broken places. Help us stop the cycles of prejudice and trauma. It is with faith in your spirit, in the name of Jesus, and for the sake of your glory that we pray these cosmic-sized hopes and ask you to hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can find ways to support the work and worship of this church on hohchurch.org, including the opportunity to text HOH to 73256. Your gifts are welcome.
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Well, you are some of those few chosen to be God's workers in God's fields that are ripe and full of abundant harvest, to be reaped in healing, in relationship, in a more just and beautiful world, in an economy more informed by God's economy and way of working. So as you go out today, then, go out in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the love of God, and in the communion of the Holy Spirit. In the name of that same Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.